Amen. God bless you all this morning. Wonderful to be in the house of the Lord. Let us all stand and we'll open our service with a word of prayer. Crying and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you this morning, Lord, and to open our service, Father, Lord, we want to put you first in everything that we do and say this morning, Lord, and the words that are spoken and the ears that are open, Father, Lord, and Lord, we want to grow in the likeness of you this morning a little bit more, and Lord, be with us as we worship you, Lord, with some songs, and Lord, most of all, to be able to hear your word, Father, and Lord, we don't count that lightly because you have chosen us, Lord, as your children to be able to hear your word, Lord, mainly to understand. Lord, we thank you for everything you do for us in our lives, Father. Be with us this morning. Be with Brother Brian as he comes to speak. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. You can be seated. Sing that chorus, God is good, all the time. <clears throat> God is good. All the time He put a song of praise in this heart of mine God is good all the time Through the darkest night His light will shine God is good, oh God is good all the time if you're walking through the valley and there's shadows all around, do not fear for he will guide you, he will keep you safe and sound, cause he's promised to never leave you nor forsake you. And his word is true, God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, his light will shine. God is good, oh God is good all the time we were sinners so unworthy still for us he chose to die filled us with his holy spirit now we can stand and testify that his love is everlasting and his mercies they will never end god is good all the time he put a song of praise in this heart of mine god is good all the time through the darkest night his light will shine god is good God is good all the time. Amen. He is good to us. Amen. I want to thank the Lord for getting my dad out of the hospital soon. He was only in there for a little over a day with a small bowel and obstruction. So uh, thank you for your prayers. I mostly thank the Lord for getting him out of there with no surgery needed and uh, nothing worse. And, uh, and I think God puts those little things in my life uh, to remind me how to pray. Because when it's somebody closer to you, you have more feeling. And uh, so when it comes time for prayer requests, I, um, I don't thank God for putting my dad in the hospital, but I thank him for giving me the opportunity to, to draw closer in prayer. Amen? And so we want to take our prayer requests to the Lord this morning. Um, does anyone have a request they'd like to know. <clears throat> Amen. Sister Elaine is patient with cancer this morning. Rick, remember him in prayer? Any other spoken prayer requests? <clears throat> 
Amen. Brother Nick would ask for prayer this morning. He has a court date on uh, Tuesday, so remember him in prayer for his uh, uh, court date. And that God would be in everything that we do. Amen? Amen. Let's continue to remember uh, for healing Brother John McCray, Brother Joe White, Brother Brian Chips, and Brother Caldwell, Brother Frongus in Australia, and also for Brother Mabuka in Congo. I know that uh, I can't remember which brother it was. There was an email floating around where hit the daughter had preeclampsia in her pregnancy, and they were still all not quite full term at 32 weeks or something. So, anyways, remember them in prayer that God would uh, be with them. I know how that is. We, me and Christina, had it with Ella on their first one, so it was a little scary. And uh, also for the needs in India, and also for uh, needs in Uganda. Also remember uh, Brother Ray Mutes and Sister Sue there up in Toledo this morning at the uh, um, the La Fontaine's church. Uh, he spoke for us Wednesday, and if you missed that, I encourage you to go back uh, to the archives and, and watch that service. And Brother Ray is a, a true missionary to the Malawi people in South Africa. He has spent a lot of time over there. Amen. Good to see Brother Don and Sister Cindy back with their sunshine Florida tans. <laughs> we miss you when you're not here. So all of our prayer requests that are unspoken, you can make those known by an uplifted hand, and we'll go to the Lord's Prayer this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we indeed grateful, Lord, to be before you this morning, and Lord, knowing that you uh, have given us grace and mercy, Lord, and the needs, Lord, that we have spoken about this morning. Father, Lord, we lay them at your feet, Lord, for Sister Helena's uh, patient, Rick, Father, and the family that's claiming healing, Lord, by knowing you, Father. So, Lord, we ask that you would uh, grant healing to them this morning, Father, and Lord, for Brother Nick and his court date on Tuesday, Father, Lord, we lift that before you this morning, Lord, and that you would be on Brother Nick's side, Father, and the judge would even be di rightly dividing as the wisdom of Solomon, Lord, was here upon us, Lord. I know it's not the same thing, but Lord, we know that you can uh, be in everything that we pray for, Father, and so for that judge to make the right decision, Father. Lord, we just ask that you would be with us this morning for those healing requests that we continually mention before you, Father. Lord, in the lifted hands this morning, whatever the desire that is underneath that lifted hand, Father, you know us better than we know ourselves, Father, and so, Lord, we are thankful for that, and Lord, we lift those requests before you this morning. We grant this service to you, Lord, that everything that's done and said be glorifying to you, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Number 266, Because He Lives. God sent His Son, they call Him Jesus, He came to love, heal and forgive, He lived and died, to buy my pardon. to prove my Savior lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know Life is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day I'll cross that river, I'll fight life's fire. No As death 
gives way to victory. I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know the future and life is worth the living just because he lives Amen Brother uh, Brian had given me a request just as we were done uh, so Brother Steve and Brother Steve if you would come we'll have you take up this morning's tithe and offering we'll go ahead and mention this request as well uh, Brother David, uh, Brother David in England. Uh, anyways, and then also for Yapo, and it's a job in Africa. Also, there's a lot of flooding going on in the Ohio River, all the way down to Louisville, and all the way to Arkansas, actually. So remember those brothers and sisters that may live on the coast or the river banks that may be affected with the high waters. Brother Steve Gray, if you would ask the Lord's blessing on the offering this morning. Heavenly Father, we humbly ask that you would remember these requests that we put before you this day, Father. We thank you for all the things you do for us individually, collectively as part of your bride, Father. And we're grateful now to return this tithe and offering to you. We ask your blessings on it. May it be for your glory, we ask in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. While they're taking that up, we'll just sing the chorus, I love you, Lord. <clears throat> I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. My soul rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Amen. God bless you this morning. Let us all stand and we'll change your order of service. Sing only believe as we ask Brian to come. Only believe, only believe, only believe that all things are possible. Only believe, Jesus, you're here. All things are possible 
Now that you're here, Jesus, you're here. Jesus, you're here, and all things are possible now that you're here. Amen. If we'd open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for your word, knowing that it is by grace that we are saved, and yet it comes through the instrument of revelation, because your grace is there, but unless it's revealed to us, O oh God, we have no clue, no clue of your gracious love and mercy toward we, your children. So, Father, we ask you that you would Help us, O oh God, to understand these words because <clears throat> a lot of people claim to believe in grace, but they've brought it into disgrace. And so a lot of people believe that their salvation is based on their works, what they have done. But we know it's through grace. We know it's through faith, grace through faith. So we ask that you'd help us to understand that faith and how it is, how it actually opens to us your grace. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. Now this morning I would like to take our subject for this text and go into the scripture to show how that faith is what brings us to or opens the door to the grace of God whereby we are saved. And Good to have you both back. As you know, faith is revelation. And since there is only one faith, thus there is only one revelation. That is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is by the revelation of Jesus Christ that we are able to see the grace of God. And through this revelation, we are able to receive this grace that God has ordained for us that not only saves us, but is ordained to change us from mortal to immortal in this hour. Now notice the scripture says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And then the apostle Paul adds, and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. So you see that this revelation is not something we come up with, but rather it comes from God, as it is a gift from God, and it will save us. Too many people think, well, I've, you know, they, 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 they say it's a revelation, it takes a revelation, and hey, I've got it, nobody else has it. That's a little bit too proud. When we look at Revelation, we look, should be looking very humbly and say, why me, Lord? Why me, Lord? What have I ever done to deserve even one of these things that you've given? So Revelation ought to humble you, not puff you up. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, we read, The hidden things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. Therefore, it is not our being able to figure out what is going on, but by grace, God reveals that which had been hidden to us, which we know to be his purpose, his plan for us. And once he reveals it to us, it's no longer hidden, but it's known to us. However, the knowing itself is not by any power or wisdom or intellect that we may have. But it is by his grace, his sovereign will, that he reveals to us that which had been hidden. I know a lot of people look at Brother Vale and they say, Brother Vale, wow, that man was really smart. It has nothing to do with smart. There's a lot of preachers out there that are smart, but don't have revelation. I'd rather be the stupidest guy on the block and have revelation than the smartest guy that ever walked the earth and just be dumb when it comes to the things of God. <clears throat> it's not about our intellect. It's about him. The knowing itself is not by any power, wisdom, or intellect that we may have, but by his grace, his sovereign will, that he reveals to us that which has been hidden. So always be thankful that God has opened your eyes because 
More than 99.9% .9 of the world's eyes are beholden, and they cannot see what you're seeing. When Jesus came, there were six, I think, six people. There was, there was Elizabeth, and, and, and um, there was, um, oh, who are they? Um, uh, there was um, Zechariah, uh, Elizabeth, uh, the, the woman, uh, Anna, um, who was uh, the old man that said, uh, the Lord is, no, it was, the, the Lord had said, uh, um, you should not, you should not die until you see the Lord's Christ. Zechariah? Zechariah, okay. Well, Elizabeth's husband's name. No, 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 no. Simon. Anyway, there was like six people. That's it. Six people at the time that Jesus was born, they had the Holy Ghost. I know a lot of people preach that, you know, the Holy Ghost didn't come till the book of Acts. David said, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. All God's prophets were anointed with the Holy Ghost. They had a portion of the, of the Holy Ghost. All right? But it came freely. It came to all children at that point of the book of Acts and says then, the promise is unto you and to your children and so many as the Lord of God would call <clears throat> but only six were aware of what God was doing the rest look you had Pharisees that could put a needle or a pin through the scroll and the letter that they put it through they could tell you every letter it hit all the way through I could ask the smartest people and just whip off a few scriptures and ask them what it, quote me that scripture. They couldn't give you, they wouldn't have a clue. Maybe John 3, 16, you know, one or two. How about Ephesians 5, 13? Everything that is hidden will become manifested by the light, for it is the light that manifests. All right? The, the, the fact is this. It's not how intellectual we are concerning this word. It's, has God revealed his word to us? From a sermon, Message of Grace, Brother Bram said, it takes the simplicity of believing God to make his word speak out to show that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It takes a humble heart dedicated to God to bring Jesus Christ unto present tense. Amen. And if it taken theology, <clears throat> what were the Presbyterian and Methodist and Baptist and Catholic and so forth, we wouldn't have a chance as poor unlearned people. But it de doesn't take knowledge. Now he's not talking about God's knowledge, he's talking about it doesn't take your human abilities, your human knowledge, your human intellect. He says, not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, saith God. I'll unfold this mystery. And he'll cry to it, grace, grace, with shoutings and cryings. That's what it is today. God's amazing grace to his people, how he takes the illiterate, the unlearned, and he shows that Jesus is the same. Now we've all understand 1 Corinthians 2. We've, I've gone over it too many times for you not to know. The God Spirit in you, it reveals to you the things of God. For it said in verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God knows. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man the unregenerate, the one who does not have the Holy Ghost, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. It takes having the Spirit to have those things understood. That's <coughs> so what he said. He said, he said um, basically, without having the Holy Ghost, you cannot understand the things of God. Also from his sermon, Lean not unto thine own understanding, Brother Bram said, but look, friends, now listen. Nowhere in the Bible are we asked to understand. We're not asked to understand it. We're asked to believe it. Believe it by what? By faith. If you understand it, then that makes 
faith annulled. You can't understand it, but believe it anyhow. If I could understand God, I, would, I, I wouldn't have to believe God. I, I, I do not understand God. No man understands God. I cannot understand the word of God, but I accept it. I believe it. I'm not asked to understand. I, I don't went to no seminary and all this great understanding of man's knowledge on that. I just know that the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I look for him in that same category. <coughs> I know he promised what he would do in this day. I look for him to do it, and he does it. That's right. He promised grace. I looked for it and received it. He promised healing. I believed it and accepted it and received it. <coughs> What's he saying? Starts out by saying, God never promised us to understand it. God never promised us that you've got to have an understanding, you've got to have knowledge, you've got to have a theology, you've got to have this and that and the other. But then he goes and says, but I know what the promises are for the hour. Let's go to Ephesians 1. Beginning of verse 17. Let's go to 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith, your revelation in the Lord Jesus and, lo and your love, your expression of that revelation under the saints, saints I cease not to th give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayer, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, God, Jesus has a God, his name's uh, the, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he's the Father of glory, the Father of doxa. We all know what that is may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The Bible doesn't promise knowledge. Now listen, because people read this, what Brother Brown says, and they, get, and they think it gives them license to not study the message or study the word of God. They read this and they say, oh, I can just live carefree. I don't have to understand a thing. I can just be like a dumb old animal and just, you know, keep on keeping on and, and I'm going to be okay. It's like, you know, the, the woman said to Brother Vail years and years ago, she said, well, she said, um, uh, I don't understand, therefore I'm not responsible. And he said, just a minute, you are responsible. You are going to be held accountable, therefore you had better understand. You see, he goes on to say here that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. That you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory, the riches of the doxa of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power that we may that, that, that he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and, and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. <clears throat> that is all about knowing, all about understanding. So what did Brother Branham mean when he says the Bible doesn't say that we must understand or that we must know? He's talking about your own stupid intellectual figuring things out before it comes to pass. Listen, revelation, according to Webster's Dictionary, is, is, a, is, is a manifestation of divine truth. Manifestation of divine truth. And Brother Bram said, look, you have no right to try to figure out God's word until God brings it to pass. When God brings it to pass, that is the interpretation of the word. Therefore, he says, God reveals it to us. All right? <clears throat> so, notice Brother Bram's language here because he seems to indicate at the first reading that you simply do not have to have any understanding or knowledge concerning God. But then he says what seems almost contradictory, but it's not because that is not what he's telling us. In using these words, if we take them out of the context that he's using them, we end up saying it's okay to be dumb and lazy concerning the things of God if we only just believe. Believe what? But that is not what he's telling us here. He's telling us we do not have to, ha to understand how that God does what he promised to do. But we surely must understand what he promised. All we have to do is to know and believe 
what he promised to do for this hour, and then we just leave the results up to him. Then the way he does it is totally up to God because God is sovereign. And that way we don't get ahead of God like Moses did when he tried to deliver Israel on his own. <clears throat> and this takes it away from our power, our power of intellect, our power of the mind to do anything. And it places it totally back onto God to work in you both to will and to do. How can you will if you don't understand what he wants you to will? In other words, if you don't understand his will, how can you say, I, I, I'm just, or, or my, my, like Jesus said, my, my meat is to do the will of my Father. And if you have no clue what God wants you to do, then how can you will? You can't will. <clears throat> but God, by his grace, works in you to will and to do, to reveal and do. Okay, He is not saying here that you will not be able to know what God is going to do for you or even what God expects from you. He is just saying, though you may not understand how God will do what he promised to do, yet you will know that he promised it. You will be able to watch it unfold as he does it because if it were the case that we are just like dumb animals incapable of knowing, then why does God reveal to us his plan and purpose why is there revelation at all if we don't have to understand it? <clears throat> so Brother Bram is not giving license for stupidity and carelessness. He cancels out any thought that says that I do not have to understand or know by saying that I know he promised what he would do in this day. I look for him to do it and he does it. How can you say on one hand, well, we don't have to know, we don't have to understand, and then come right around and say, I know he promised what he would do in this day. He was talking about how he does. But he even gives us a clue later on. He says, God won't do anything except through his prophet. He revealed through his prophet. Amos 3 and 6. The Lord God will do nothing except he reveal it through his servants of prophets. Well, if you know what God promised, then you understand what he promised. So that throws out altogether you're having a complete lack of understanding to know what he promised. Uh, to, uh, it, it shows an un, un, understanding. Okay. <clears throat> now, Brother Branham and the Apostle Paul both taught us that the evidence that you are filled with the Holy Ghost is that you are able to know and to understand the things of God. Maybe not know how that he will do what he plans to do, but you will know what he promised and you will believe what he, uh, that he is more than able to fulfill that promise. He said, a virgin shall conceive. <clears throat> All right. A virgin shall conceive, and this one that's conceived will be the mighty God, the everlasting Father, but actually be call, he'll be called. In other words, he'll have the same name. His name will declare the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and all those things. <clears throat> well, when the one who came, fitting that scripture... All the brilliant intellectuals said, he's just an illegitimate kid. We all know that Mary was pregnant before she married Joseph, so, you know, uh, he's just a, uh, he married her out of feeling sorry for her and whatever. Why did they go back to the scripture, what the scripture says? See, they didn't know the scripture. They knew it intellectually. They could quote it and, and, and verbatim, but they had no clue what it meant. It takes revelation. So when Brother Man speaks of not being able to understand, he's talking about not being able to understand how God does things. Yet believing if God promised something, then God is more than able to perform what he promised. Therefore, don't walk away from what he said with the understanding that you don't have to understand anything concerning the things of God, but rather walk away from what he said, believing that no matter how God will do it, you know and understand that if he promised it, then it's up to him to fulfill what he promised. God promised Malachi 4, Luke 17, 30, Revelation 10. <laughs> Nobody had a clue what it meant. People surmised. Men like Dowie thought they were the one. Then God came with healing in his wings. Oh, that's a few verses earlier. Rev uh, Malachi 4 and 2. Came with healing in his wings, a great healing campaign. That ought to give the people a clue. And then he had a man 
a backwoodsman, William Branham, hunter, fisher, trapper. And God performed such supernatural that there is no way that you could say that that man wasn't totally yielded to God. God interpreting Malachi 4 by bringing it to pass. Now, <clears throat> remember he always told us the minute you think that you got it all figured out, you know for certain that you've missed it. I hope and pray that none of us get to the point where we say this got to happen, this got to happen, this got to happen, because those things might have already happened and we don't know it. From the Sermon of Three Witnesses, Brother Brown said, no, friend, no friends, no friends, uh, uh, people get, uh, they, they just get an ecclesiastical picture of some theological seminary that teaches them so, and they think that it has to be that way. God's under no obligation to no theological seminary, just to his word. That's right. They thought they had it figured out the way that Jesus was going to come and what he ought to be as the master, but when he come, it was different than what they thought, see? So why do you think 99.9% .9 of Christendom today has missed the appearing of Christ, the parousia of Christ? God's very presence among his people before the coming of the just one. Why do you think they miss the appearing and coming? Because theology. Their theology. You know, the, the <clears throat> current understanding of the rapture, as Brother Vale used to bring out, was some woman prophesied in a church service and it became doctrine. Others say, well, actually, it was the Jesuits that taught it and then Darby taught it after, he, after the Jesuits taught it. Whichever way it was, it was wrong. There's an appearing before the coming. These people have their camps where they say the church will go through the tribulation. And then they say the tribulation is going to be seven years. Show me one place in scripture that says that the tribulation will be seven years. The Bible says in the book of Daniel that, Jesus, that, the, that Messiah would be cut off in the midst of the 70th week. Midst is like halfway between, in the middle. Midst is middle. Jesus had a ministry of three and a half years, then it was cut off to the Jews. From that point on, the ministry of Jesus was to the Gentiles. <clears throat> the tribulation, when it begins, after God has taken out the Gentile bride, will be to the Jews. It's for the Jews to gather them together, rally them together under the two witnesses. God is done at that point dealing with the church. Remember the church put him on the outside. The word of God put him on the outside. He's knocking trying to get in. They totally rejected him. From Jesus Christ the same, Brother Brown said, does God, God does things in his own way. And it's always contrary to the way the clergy has it figured out. Always. Always. You know, that's a big word. Always. You historians know that. Never in any age did the clergy have it right. Be careful. Have we been? From sirs, we would see Jesus. <clears throat> Brother Brown said, and remember that God never does anything outside of what he promised to do. See, he always makes a promise. Then he comes to fulfill it. Notice, then he comes to fulfill it. Then he comes to fulfill it. It won't be fulfilled without him doing it. God at the beginning, knowing the end from the beginning, because he was infinite. We all know that. He's omnipresent, omnip omnipotent, and infinite. Now, if he's infinite, then he knows all things. And now, an omniscient, so, so notice, then he allotted his scriptures down through the age to come, and then when this age rolls around, why, 
we, we always try to, to have things figured out the way that we think it's right. But usually, if God made a promise for the age, his custom way of doing anything never changes doing it. Now remember, God never changes, never changes his ways. Because that's the reason we can definitely place our faith in God that God said to be the truth, the Bible. Now you've got to place God somewhere. <clears throat> We look at things as miracles. We call things miracles that God did. Right? You drive down the road, a huge tire comes off a truck coming the other direction, it's coming right at your car. For some reason, you're able to avoid that truck or that, that tire. Or for some reason that tire took a big old bounce went over your vehicle or his brother Peter and Diane some way the the tornado skipped over your house but continued down its path and we look at the incident itself as the miracle then science will get in they'll say well this happened because of this happened because of this happened and they'll use physics and everything else to try to figure things out they do it to try to d diminish the miracle. But the real miracle is the timing of God. The timing of your car, the timing of the bounce of the, of the tire, the timing of the, the hurricane or tornado taking its bouncing path. Not coincidence. 1997, Brother and Sister Michael had been visiting from New Jersey. The temperature was 102 degrees for six days prior. No uh, change of weather in the forecast. They said maybe another six days. People were getting sick. We bowed our heads. We asked the Lord to turn the temperature down by 30 degrees. Came out of church after service, just as hot as could be. Went to a restaurant. We were in there about 45 minutes, came out, saw a little floater. Like some of us older people see it going across your eye. But it was a little cloud up in the sky, about the size of a fist. I remember Brother Michael, some of them were standing there, I said, look at that, just a lone black cloud about the size of your fist, way up there. <clears throat> really going fast. Immediately, I thought of Elijah, the little cloud. He said, I, I hear the abundance of rain. And I said, brothers, we're about to see something. Something's about to happen. Michael and I and Helena Levon, we went to a store just to browse around a little bit while we were in the store. The lights went out. I turned to Michael, I said, something's happening outside. We walked to the front door, they had put on the emergency lights, we walked to the front door, we saw this cloud from east to west as far as you could see, it was about a mile above our head and about a, a half a mile thick. And within minutes, the temperature dropped from 102 down to about 70, 72, 30 degrees. The miracle is not that God changed the weather. The miracle is the timing. The miracle is the timing. Before you ask, he said, I'll answer. Many times we've had weather and we just didn't feel led to pray. Then there are certain times, like down in Argentina, the brothers and sisters were there sweating, 30, uh, three, 300 people in the, in the building. It was about 100, 110 degrees out. And in the building, it was even worse. And we asked the Lord to change the weather because he's the same. He changes not. He doesn't, he's not a respecter of persons. And the people were so hot and sweaty that I just said, let's bow our heads in prayer. And I said, Lord, you remember back in 97, your, your, your children in Kentucky? Well, these are your children, too. And I'm asking you, 
in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to do the same thing, to show yourself the same yesterday, today, and forever. And by the time we finished service, we walked to the building next door, 20 feet across. During that time, the winds came and just blew the temperature down by 30 degrees. Was a miracle a change in the weather? Well, that's a miracle, but a greater miracle was the timing. Because God could have waited another week and done it. And we wouldn't have thought it in answer to prayer. But the fact that it was already on its way and he, t he gave us revelation to pray for the right thing. You see how God works? You see how when, when uh, Joshua stood there, they held his hands up, he commanded the, the sun to stand still. The situation was that they needed more light, they needed more time. And they held his hands up for 12 hours and God gave them 12 hours more of light. <coughs> Why didn't it happen? The earth shift, the earth pull, because China said that was their shortest day on record. Shortest day. Israel, it was their longest day, 24 hours of sunlight. Why didn't it happen a week earlier, the pole shift? Because God's timing was such. He knows all events that are happening. He knows before they happen. Before you even ask, I'll answer. And you see, the real miracle is in the timing of God. And so we have a shout and a voice and a trump. And people in the denominational Christianity, they think that's just one event. They think it's God comes down and the shout is the voice, is the trump. Of course, instantaneously in the, in the, in the twinkle of an eye will be God up. Out of here. <clears throat> and they missed, they missed 60 years or 50 some years of the shout. It's a period of time. They will also miss the resurrection, the voice. Because the real miracle is the time, is the timing. We are living under the shout right now, brother, sister. Be thankful for that, that God has opened your eyes to it. Pray that at the timing of the voice, you'll be aware of that too. That should be your prayer. Father, you're not a respect for persons. You've already opened my eyes to your shout, to your message. I pray you'll also make me aware of the voice because the shout was for me. Therefore, the voice will be for me. Therefore, the trump will be for me. I don't care how you do it, Lord, but when you do it, the timing is critical. May my will be your will. You said you're God working in us to will and then to do. May I have your will that I might do. And of course, God has always sent us a prophet. As Brother Brown said, that's the reason we can definitely place our faith in what God has said to be the truth, because the Bible declares it. And God sends a prophet, and surely the Lord God will do nothing lest he reveal his, it unto, or through his servants, the prophets. And the prophet is not some sovereign individual that can use his gift for any reason that he deems fit. He is totally surrendered to God and doesn't say anything but what God tells him to say. And many times he doesn't even understand what he's saying, but God understands and only, and, and, and only will fulfill and bring the correct interpretation to what he has said in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> you think Isaiah understood a virgin shall conceive? <clears throat> you think the Old Testament prophets have said when they saw the chariots, Chariots upon chariots and the and, 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 and the, the flaming fires behind him. Brother Brown said that was the tail lights. That's cars. Men too sh shall come to and fro and, and this and that. They didn't understand what they were seeing. They had chariots to identify with. A man riding in a vehicle. A chariot. That's what they called him. 
They didn't have the terminology we have today. <coughs> That's what they called him. When Brother Bram saw the uh, fifth vision, the cars running, dr driving by themselves, he said, I don't, I don't know what kept him on the road and stuff. He said, you know, I, I, I call a radar because that's all they had back then is radar. Didn't know. That, that, GPS wasn't even invented yet. Global positioning service. It wasn't even invented yet. <clears throat> so he used terminology of his day. And that's what you have in the prophets. But only fulfillment will bring the correct interpretation to what he said in the name of the Lord. He said in the book of Acts 13.41, Behold, you despisers, wander and perish, for I will work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Who had any clue what that meant until God came, did all this wonderful work, and had a man, William Branham, declare it? Fulfillment is the interpretation of the word of God. Now notice this, I will do the work, but a man shall declare to you. Well then who is that man and what does he represent? He represents a ministry of grace to the people, though God will be the one doing it, yet the man will be declaring it. God came down with a shout, but we heard it through the lips and the voice of William Branham. William Branham, when he talked about the self-driven car, oh, I've already gone that. <clears throat> but that doesn't change the promise. It just means that we don't understand how God will fulfill what he promised. But just because we don't know how God will fulfill what he promised, uh, it doesn't mean that he won't do exactly what he promised to do. From I have heard, but now I see, he said, so we don't use the gift of God for commercial. No, no. He could tell me where it was at, but I don't have any need of it. I wouldn't even have faith even to ask him. <coughs> See, if I had need of it, I believe that, he, uh, uh, that if I had asked him, he'd tell me. But first, you see, your motives and objectives have to be right. You have to have reason for this. God don't give you those things just because you ask. You, 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 and you cannot ask in faith unless there's a real objective to that, to be in the will of God. See, if you want to be well, what do you want to be well for? See, if you want to be healed, what's the reason you want to be healed? What are you telling God? What do you want to do with your life when you get healed? See, there, there's got to be, you've got to have a motive and objective, and they have to be right according to the will of God, and then is when the faith is revealed to you. And God, by sovereign grace, placed that faith in there, then it's over, see? <laughs> Look, in 2006, in Uganda, this big storm comes. I had been preaching for a half an hour, and you all know the story, but I'm going to tell it again because I'm trying to show you a point here. All right? I couldn't hear myself even preach. You know, the, they don't have insulation like we have. They don't have drywall for, in the ceilings. They had just the metal from the roof, and then you see the rafters going across. That's it. And the winds were blowing it, coming up under the eaves, and <laughs> you know, I thought the sheets were going to come off like they had four years earlier when uh, a brother from Canada was preaching there and four people were killed, 40 were injured. I just, the, the raindrops were huge, uh, you know, the size of a, a golf ball, the, 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 the hailstones were coming down the size of a golf ball, so I went over to sit down. <laughs> and when I did, the Holy Spirit rebuked me and said, what are you sitting for? Have not I sent you? I said, yes, Lord, you sent me. He said, then take charge of me. Now, I had no clue how to take charge of that. Couldn't even hear myself preach. But in obedience, not knowing how God was going to do it. But I knew what he told me to do. So I started taking, and, and when I took my first step, he gave me a, I call it a revelation, but it was like a, it was like a mental vision. You know, when you were kids, you had daydreams. Your eyes were open, but you saw yourself playing in the field. You, you know, you just, whatever. And, and it wasn't a vision, vision, but it was like in your mind. Well, that's exactly what it was. And I saw Jesus sitting up in the boat when the waters were coming over. The disciples were afraid they were going to drown. And he said, peace be still. And I had been preaching on that relationship between the father and son. And God was obligated. Whatever he did for the son, he was, able, he was obligated to his sons. And we saw it in Brother Branham. We, or in the firstborn son, we saw it in Brother Branham. I'd, been, I'd gotten that far in the sermon. 
<coughs> then we had this test of our faith. So by this time I took the second step, I saw William Branham running around the tree, praising God because he stopped the storm. So I knew, hey, God's not a respecter of persons. Never forget that. He's not a respecter of persons. If he did something for somebody and you have the same need, he's obligated to do for you if you go to him the same way they went. Well, then the next four steps I was taking to the, uh, I took to the pulpit, the devil got on my back and said, you're going to make a fool of yourself. Now, I had a choice. Do I listen to the devil and not say anything? Or do I listen to the Holy Spirit and say, I don't care if I'm a fool. I don't care if, if, the, if, if I'm going to be a fool. And, and I, all I could think of was that Brother Brad tell the story about the man wearing the sign on his front and said, I'm a fool for Christ. And on the back said, whose fool are you? So I was going to, I said to the devil, same thing. I'm a fool for Christ. Whose fool are you? I went to the pulpit and I said, now I take every spirit in here under my control for the glory of God. Now you say, well, what by what authority do you have that? I had because God told me to do it. He said, take charge of the meeting. I had no example except for William Branham. So all William Branham did, he said, I take charge of every spirit in here under my control for the glory of God. I did what he did. Now you say, well, isn't that presumptuous? Hey, I'm just following the lead. I'm following the example. I have no clue how God is going to do these things, but I'm going to do what I saw an example to do of an older brother and, an old, and the eldest brother. And so I did. Now listen, we're talking about the timing is a miracle. Because no sooner had I rebuked Satan, told him that his stinger was pulled out on Calvary, and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I told him to desist, it stopped. And if you can watch the film, you can see the lights come on. But there was no lights in the church, no electricity. It was so dark outside that all of a sudden it became light. And then I told you about how I, we, you know, I, I finished three and a half hours of preaching, <clears throat> went out the side door, and I could see the storm was still there everywhere. But then when I looked up, it was a big old circle around the, you know, like we were in the eye of a hurricane or whatever. The timing was the miracle. Then we went to lunch, had to drive into the rain, had to listen to that thunder and everything else, come back after an hour, drove into the light, started up the service, and five minutes into the sermon, boom, the, the hail was back, the wind was back, the rain was back, everything was back, and this time I knew God's not a respecter of persons, I'll pray again, and when I went to the, I mean, I was at the pulpit, I said, brothers, we need to bow our heads and pray. And then somebody, something spoke to me and said, I'll honor it if you do because I'm not a respecter person, but they're going to try to make you another William Branham. And their sons also, I want them to pray. God was giving them an opportunity to step into that word the same as I had about uh, four hours earlier, four and a half hours earlier. So those brothers began to pray and God did the same thing and the whole storm went away. Now you say, well, that's just coincidence. Okay, you call it what you want to. That's unbelief. I call it the timing of God is a great, yeah, that's the miracle. Because you, he places the need that he places in your heart for an overcoming of that need. And then he places the answer right there. That's the real miracle. Being caught up in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, like Brother Bram said, he said the rapture will be so natural that it'll pass right through you unless you are aware. That's what he said. Well, being aware means that you're aware of the day and the hour. You're aware of God's presence. You're walking like Enoch did, and one day you just kept walking and you didn't realize, but you've gone up to heaven. Peter got out there and he had his eyes on Jesus and he walked on water. He wasn't aware of anything else except for Jesus. Then when he got splashed by one of the waves, he looked down and that's when he began to sink and Jesus reached out, grabbed him, pulled him back up on top of the water and then they walked to the boat. Hallelujah. You've got to have a motive and objective and they have to be right according to the will of God. The devil said you're going to make a fool of yourself, but my motive and objective was just to be obedient. I had no clue how to take charge of the meeting. But my motive and my objective was I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to start walking to the pulpit. 
I'm hoping he'll reveal to me by the time I get to the pulpit what to do because I'll, I'll get there and, and I have no clue. And he did. And like I said, in, in a half a second's time, I had a 30 second, it seemed like 30 seconds, of, of like a mental vision where I saw the whole scene of, of the waves coming, Jesus asleep in the boat, <coughs> all that. <coughs> and then Jesus sits up, takes charge over the storm. The eldest son. By the time it took the second step, which is another half a second or so, I had another about 30 second mental vision of Brother Branham running around the tree. <clears throat> another son having taken charge over a storm. Now it's going to be easy because all I had to do was do what they did. That's it. So if our motive is right, our objective is right, ask what you will and it shall be done. <clears throat> God is sovereign. And he, uh, God, by your sovereign grace, places that faith in there. God placed the storm so that he'd have his servant who'd be frustrated. He knew that I'd go sit down, but he also knew that I would listen. We see in 1 Peter 1 and 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope, that is a hope that's been made alive, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ out from among the dead. And then notice what he says this hope will take us to. To an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fainteth not away, reserved in heaven for you. What's uncorruptible? What's undefiled? The word you think your inheritance is going to be gold and silver and palaces and everything else? Forget it. It's the word. Because by the word you can create a world and go live on it. That's right. Who needs a thing when, when you've got a spoken word that can create anything? You need a squirrel? You're hungry? I don't know if you eat squirrels or not, Don, but <coughs> you know what I mean. He liked squirrels. He loved them. A lot of people do. Us that have never tasted them probably just think of a rat. He enjoyed them. And God gave him the squirrel. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, the faith not away, reserved in heaven for you, and you who are kept by the power of God through faith. What is the power of God? Acts Chapter 1, verse 18. The word of God, or, or Romans, excuse me, Romans 1, 18. The word of God, or the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Who are kept by the word of God, the power of God is his word. God said it, it's got to happen. Through faith, through revelation, we are kept, and we are brought to salvation, which is ready to be revealed when? In the last time. This end time revelation at the last time brings us salvation. So we're looking at the last time revelation that brings salvation or deliverance that it says is yet to come at the end time. That's what Peter is speaking about here. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, that's the key right there, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold testings. If need be, he says. Then your trials are all in direct correlation to what you have need of. So every trial then is fitted to your present condition. You don't have a certain trial because you don't have a, a need for that trial. You have a certain trial because you have a need for that trial. <clears throat> that the trial of your faith, your revelation, be much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried by, with fire, it might be found, it leads to Praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. What is praise? It's the fruit offering of your lips, giving thanks to his name. What is honor? It's a Greek word which means to take the lower seat. See? So that you can be brought up. He that humbles himself shall, uh, uh, shall be exalted. <laughs> and it brings you to glory. <laughs> it brings you to the dokes of God at the appearing, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, this tells us that this end time revelation of Christ is to bring with it testing, but will produce something in us that is far more valuable than gold, 
which has to be tested with fire testing. It is to bring to us to the place of glory, which is the dopes of God, the very opinions, values, and judgments of God, and it is to come at the appearing of the Lord. And we know that we are living now in the time of the appearing of Christ. For God's prophet taught us in his sermon, End Time Evangelism, he said, Now we have already seen and are witnessing the appearing of the Lord. Now remember, appearing and coming is two different words, to appear and then to come. Now is the appearing. He's already appeared in these last days, right here with us in the last few years. Now it's a sign of his coming. He's appearing in the church in the form of the Holy Spirit, showing that it's him. <clears throat> because people cannot do these things that you see the Holy Spirit doing. So that's the appearing of the Lord. Now remember, it spoke both places, appearing and coming. And again, he said, in we would see Jesus. He said, remember, appearing and coming is two different words. See, he's appearing now in the church, showing himself alive after 2,000 years. So Peter continues in verse 8, Whom having not seen, you love, and in whom now, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Notice, this appearing will not be a visible man, but the invisible God who will unveil himself in such a way as by words he will be declared to us and unveiled before us. That is what we are told in the book of Acts. Behold, ye despisers and wonder and perish. I work a work in your day, a work which you, you shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. And notice Peter tells us that this unveiling of the mighty God at the end time will bring us into the full dokes of God, into the fullness of God's opinion, in the fullness of God's values, and the fullness of God's judgments. And then he says, receiving the end of your faith, the goal of your revelation, even the salvation of your soul, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. <clears throat> so the prophets were looking for an end time grace and that takes us back to, by grace are you saved through faith. But it takes the faith, the revelation, to bring you an understanding of that grace. So, he says, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ was in them did signify. When it testified beforehand of the suffering of Christ and the glory, the doxa, that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, not unto the Old Testament prophets, they didn't understand the things that they were saying. They didn't actually have a clue what was actually going to transpire. They just said what God told them to say. But unto us they did minister those things which are now reported unto you by them which have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from, from heaven, which, angel, which things the angels desire to look into. <coughs> now notice, <coughs> he is telling us that the prophets that spoke of the coming Messiah were not fully aware of themselves of the full understanding of what that, those prophecies were all about. They were pointing to the coming of Messiah, the just one, but each, each had an understanding in part, but the revealing of Christ brought the total picture into fullness. And now in verse 13 he says, uh, this is where I want to get to uh, get us to this morning. 1 Peter 1 and 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we see that there is to be an end time grace, that is, to be, that is to accompany the end time revelation of Jesus Christ. And notice his words again. Hope to the end. That you might hope to the end for the grace. That is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Christ. Those are precious words. Because we're saved by grace. Through faith. Through revelation. Father you've given to us a shout. A revelation. The unveiling of Christ. The mighty God revealed. The mighty God unveiled before us. Now, Father, I'm looking for that revelation to lead me to your grace. That I'll be included in those things which you have for us in this hour. <clears throat> we know that this end time grace is a special endowment or revelation from the Father that brings us to the place of becoming fully mature sons and daughters of God by bringing us into the very glory of God, which is his doxa, which is the very mind of God coming into us as we see the next few scriptures. Colossians 1.27 To whom God would make known to whom, that's you, God would make known see there, you got to know because he's making known what is the riches of his glory, his doxa, of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you. Which is your hope of having the doxa. Notice Christ in you the hope of receiving the doxa of God. So we see that God gave us of his spirit that we might have an, a hope 
or an expectation or an anticipation of receiving the very mind or mindset. You see, if he did, if he did so to his firstborn son, then we know that he will do so to other sons because we come into the very image. For Jesus was the first fruits, and Jesus prayed in John 17 that we would be one with God in the same manner that he was one with the Father. And he said he gave us the same very, the very same glory, the very same doxa that God had given to him in order for us to be one with God. In John 17, 21, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory, the dokes of the opinions, values, and judgments which thou gavest me, that I might be one with thee, I have given them that they might be one with thee, even as we are one. So that even as we are one tells us that it's re he received the glory of God, which made him one with God, and now his prayer is that we would receive that same glory, that we would be one. And, and this is something God has already began to initiate. <coughs> Brother Brown said in his sermon, Works as Faith Expressed, said, now faith is a revelation from God. Now faith is a revelation. There's where I want to stay there just a moment. It's a revelation. He, he has revealed it to you by his grace. It's nothing you did. You didn't work yourself onto, into faith. You never had faith. It's given to you by the grace of God. And God reveals it to you. Therefore, faith is a revelation. And the whole church of God is built upon the revelation. Again, from a sermon, Invisible Union, <coughs> of the bride, <coughs> <Excuse me. coughs> he said, now, there's only one way that you can be saved, and that's by faith are you saved, and that by grace. The grace of God spoke to you. It brought you to the altar. So getting back to 1 Peter 1 and 13, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. All right? Be sober and hope to the end for the grace of that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now notice that we are to hope for the grace that is to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then we are to gird up our minds, and therefore at the time of the great revelation of Christ, we are to receive a special dispensation of grace. And this grace is to be multiplied, bringing grace, grace unto it at the time of the capstone ministry of Christ. Notice Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1 and 3, he said, Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched. This word enriched means like fertilizer, we are enriched. We enrich the soil to produce a finished, fully mature harvest from, from just a seed in the beginning. <clears throat> when do you fertilize a plant? You don't wait till it's all grown. You, you fertilize it after it's been, it's been sowed and it starts to come up. That's when the grace comes in and, it, and that's when the fertilizer comes in and it, makes, it brings it to, it gives you all the nutrients that you'll need to become a fully mature plant. All right? Now this word enrich means like fertilizer, we enrich the soil to produce a finished fully mature harvest just uh, you know, from, seed to, uh, from just a seed in the beginning that in everything you are enriched by him. Notice, it is he that is doing the fertilizing. That in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance, that word is logos, and in all knowledge, that word is gnosko, and it means an experiential understanding, knowledge. And it's the same word that speaks of the Lord descending in this hour in all power and knowledge. And remember, Jesus himself has explained the parable of the two sowers, and he said, it is given to you to know but to them it is not given to know or to understand. And the word given is the Greek word echo. So it's given to you to be able to echo back. And you can't echo unless you really have an understanding of what you're talking about. Now I'm getting back to 1 Corinthians 1 and 6. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, established in you, so that you come behind in no gift. The word gift is the Greek word charisma, and it means endowment. In other words, when we speak of a child being gifted, it does not mean they are athletic, but they are mentally endowed to be able to understand what others among their peers just don't seem to be able to understand. Thus, this grace is to endow us to be able to understand the unveiling or the revelation of Jesus Christ. Then he says, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, that means the testimony or witness of Christ was established in you, so that you come behind in no gift, in no lack of understanding, and we could go on, look, I, we could take that being witnessed in you and go over to Romans 8 
show you that it's God working in you. God is it's is God it's it's His Spirit bearing witness with your spirit. All all those things and how that comes together. Waiting for the coming, the apocalypses are unveiling or revealing, which is the, the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is exactly what Peter told us would come. He said this grace would get us ready for the unveiling of Christ. And he told us to gird up our loins, the loins of our mind, which means to get ready to move out because it will come fast, it will come furious, just like a race. As it says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it will come from image to image and from glory to glory. From doxa to doxa, from opinion to opinion, from judgment to judgment, from values to values, just keep boom, 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 boom. Now, let's continue reading 1 Corinthians 1 and 8. Who shall also confirm you, that means who shall establish you. So we see that God himself is the one who will establish us all the way unto the end. Remember, it's God working in you to will and to do. He that began the good work shall perform it. All right. For the scripture tells us, he, uh, okay, we already read, and, and he's here to do it. So it is God who gave us the promise who comes to make sure the promise is fulfilled. Brother Ram said, he that gave us the word is here to confirm it. That's exactly what it said in the presence of God and recognize that working for this one purpose, for you to recognize the presence of Jesus Christ. See, if he is present, then he proves, uh, excuse me, then why everything is settled. He made the word. He is here to confirm it. He proves that he'll confirm it. He is, he is just the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we see that he himself has come in this hour to confirm his own word to us and to confirm you or establish you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ as Peter told us. <laughs> now, let's continue with 1 Corinthians 1 and pick up at verse 9. God is faithful by whom we are called into the fellowship of his son Jesus Christ. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and same judgment. Now, how can you all say the same thing unless you're having the same thoughts? Right? Now, this word judgment is a Greek word, gnome, which means to be in the same consciousness or the same mind. Now, Brother Bram said in his sermon, God's only provided place of worship. He said, but now we come to the head, the capstone, grace, grace. The capstone cry. The headstone crying what? Grace, grace, passed from death and creed into the living word of the living God. God's only provided plan for his age, his sons in the word age, quickened by the spirit like a spark that slid off something to make it alive. And seated now in heavenly places, in present tense, already alive and subject to, to every promise in the word. Then, what does that do? You being a part of God's gene, a part of the word, other men a part of God's word, seated together, manifest the entire body of Christ because there's no leaven among you. See? What's he talking about, Brother, Brother Brown? No leaven among you, just the word only. Seated in heavenly place in the door where he puts his name, Christ Jesus. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> why do I say no leaven among you? Because there's too much speculation. Speculation is doctrine. People get their own little mind, their own teachings, their own doctrine. And try to say, well, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. It's like today, you know, we uh, on the 23rd, two days ago, five planets have lined up. And there are people saying, well, see, that means that the, the, the rapture is going to take place this spring. We don't know that. They lined up also in 2016. Some are saying, well, March 15th, uh, planet X is going to come through and the whole world is going to be destroyed. Well, Brother Bram said in 1962, he said, you know, the, the Indian scientists said that there, these five planets lining up, that, uh, you know, the Earth's going to be destroyed. And our American, uh, the American press, they made fun of it. He said, don't make fun of that. Someday it's going to be like that. Now, he said, not that the world's going to be destroyed, but the planet's going to line up. Something's going to happen. All right. But just leave it at that. You know, if you're walking hand in hand with him, you don't care what's going on out there. You know, they, they, they jump ahead of the picture. And, and, and then when March 15th comes and goes, and the world isn't destroyed, they've got egg on their face. Just walk with him. Walk with him. Now, things are going to happen one day because the book of Revelation says they will, but we're not going to be here for it. We won't be here for it. Those are the judgments, and God doesn't judge the bride. Brother Vale, when he first met Brother Branham, 
They went through all the doctrine, you know, no eternal hell, all that stuff. <coughs> they were having a really good time. Then they came to the bride doesn't go through the tribulation. Brother Vell was one of these guys, seven year tribulation guy, you know, uh, bride, you know, the church goes through the tribulation. Brother Vell told him, no, bride doesn't go through the tribulation. Brother Vell went home and studied it. He said, I, 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 after, I, after I look at what tribulation means, go right to the root word. Retribution. Why would any man have retribution against his wife? So he said, okay, I understand now. No leaven among you. No leaven. No little ideas that you got to push in. Just let it be. So what does that mean, no leaven? Well, you we find that Jesus tells us in Matthew 16 what leaven represents. Matthew 16 and 5. And when his disciples come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not understand, neither remember the five loaves and five thousand and how, no, and how many baskets you took up? Neither the seven loaves and the four thousand and how many baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, but that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. The purpose of a true fivefold ministry is to bring the people to a place where they're no longer babies, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by the sight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There's one doctrine you should be concerned with, and that's the doctrine of Christ. Am I walking with him? Is he in me? Am I one with him? That's it. Notice the Bible says, Beware of the false doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And Brother Branham is letting us know that there is no leaven, or rather, there is no false doctrine amongst this particular group that has the grace, grace, the headstone, or the capstone ministry. No leaven among you that brings the entire fullness of the Godhead bodily among you. Not in you. Among you. The purifier was among us. Couldn't do it in Luther's age. Couldn't do it in Wesley's age. Couldn't do it in the Pentecostal age. But in the day when the Son of Man will be manifested, revealed, brought back the church together with the entire deity of God amongst his people, showing the same visible signs, manifesting himself like he did at the beginning when he was manifested on earth in the form of a prophet, God, oh glory, promised by Malachi 4, promised by the rest of the scriptures. Where you at? Or where you worship at? The house of God seated in present tense. How did the church miss him? By looking down the road, looking back. Forget it. Walk with him day by day. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear, dear, dear Lord Jesus, we want to thank you, Father, and knowing that your son, Jesus, was so obedient to you, and yet you tested him in Gethsemane, but he passed the test, and he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. We're having our trial of our faith, our testing of our revelation in this hour, <clears throat> our Gethsemane is before us but may we turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full into his wonderful face that the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace help us O God to walk day by day with thee in Jesus Christ's name we pray Amen sing that song in closing turn your eyes upon Jesus we're just at 375 I think
or no, that's uh, is it in the uh, this book here? Huh? Seven. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see.